If you perform, will they come? And will they hear the gospel? Ships of gold. Liar, liar, pants on fire. What are you saying? Well, that's interesting. Well, that and more coming up next on Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year in order. Now today we're going to talk about read in terms of Chronicles, Second Chronicles and First Kings chapter 10 through 9, 10 through 11. And uh, our reading is Second Chronicles 9, 1 through 9. If you perform, they will come. But will they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? You can perform, but will they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? That and more coming up later. Right now, what are you doing? Well, today we are taking in, we're, we're focusing in on the reign of King Solomon. Now, the Bible talks about how he got gold of Ophir, or gold from Ophir, and he did this via ships. So we are taking a look at that within the scriptures today. Okay, very good, Ryan. Well, today I had to stop and talk one last time with prominent UFO researcher Gary Bates because he has done some extremely interesting research in this area regarding the identity of these supposed alien beings, which is what we've been talking about on the program. Hope you stick around for that. All right, that and more coming up. So as we get ready for Corey, she's getting ready to go off and take care of her stuff. But right now, let's study what she's going to do. Solomon is one of the most famous kings of ancient Israel. And the Bible tells us that he created a vast network of trade throughout the ancient Middle East and beyond. So right now, you and I are going to explore this trading empire from the standpoint of his trade routes in the sea. Nestled in amongst King Solomon's very long list of accomplishments is a fleet of ships on the Red Sea constructed with his close ally, Hiram, King of Tyre. 1 Kings chapter 9 records how they worked together to build a fleet of merchant ships at Etzion Gever near Eilat on the shore of the Red Sea. From Etzion Gever, they would send ships to Ophir to acquire the famed gold of Ophir, exotic woods, and precious gems, and ships to Tarshish that would bring back gold, silver, ivory, and exotic animals. The modern-day identities of Tarshish and Ophir have proven puzzling. But due to an 8th century BC inscription that refers to the gold of Ophir, that they existed is no longer questioned. In the past, historians and respected archaeologists have tried to identify the remains of Etzion Gever. This port city would be somewhere on the Red Sea, the modern Gulf of Eilat and Aqaba. The answer to this ancient mystery may lie in what is now the only natural anchorage in the northern gulf. The modern-day ports are completely man-made. Just seven miles south of modern Eilat is a small island known as Jazirat Faroon, meaning Pharaoh's Island. Across its surface, there are medieval ruins and the remains of a man-made small harbor that is now mostly filled in with silt. The island is only 900 feet away from the mainland, which forms a large natural anchorage, a natural safe harbor. 
paired with the remains of an ancient seawall that went around the entire perimeter of the island, complete with defensive towers that stretched out into the smaller man-made harbor, and Jazirat Faroon begins to look like an interesting option for the home of the fleets of Solomon. We're studying superheroes of the Bible. Our present culture rewards thousands of people with billions of dollars as they act like people they are not. We call them actors. Now, the entertainment industry is filled with actors who morph from one personality to the next and make millions of dollars for each movie. The Greek word is actor or hypocrite. Our culture is very much about performance, in fact, when someone is genuinely the same on camera as off, we gasp at the novelty. It is unusual Solomon had fame throughout the ancient world of being endowed with wisdom from above. But much of how Solomon lived was a performance, and there were many who loved the show. Now, the Queen of Sheba was one of them. Let's study them today. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions, having a very great retinue, camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be king for the Lord your God. Because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever, therefore he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Welcome to Bible Discovery, Quick Study Television. Rod Hember here, and I am glad you decided to join us. Today we have an interesting study on the scripture, on the wisdom of Solomon. Now Solomon, let me introduce this to you. Solomon is actually uh, empowered with wisdom uh, to lead God's people and to welcome God's people and help God's people, and his wisdom is very strong. Now this affects the whole empire and it affects the people around the empire. The whole world is looking at Solomon after all, it was a big world at the time. And so Solomon becomes very wise. And a woman by the name of Sheba, Queen of Sheba, comes up to see Solomon. And she comes up because she's heard about the wisdom and she's, her wise men have told her, well, you should go see Solomon. You know, he's great and all this. And she said, I came up here to see you, to see if this wisdom is true. And she found out it was true. And so here is the reading assignment as we focus on it. We call this strong performances. Reading assignment is 1 Kings 10 to 11 from 2 Chronicles chapter 9. Now our focus is on 2 Chronicles chapter 9, 1 through 8. It's longer if you read the Bible guide and go into the Bible guide 
But today, we're only going to get to the eight verse. Okay, so let's take a look now at the first verse of 2 Chronicles chapter 8 or chapter 9. Now, here we go. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with her hard questions, having very great retinue camels uh, that bore spices, gold, abundance, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke to him about all that was in her heart. Now, all that was in her heart. She must have had questions that have arisen in her kingdom that were in her heart and that she wanted answers to. So this is interesting. She spoke to him about all that was in her heart. Now, here is the point as we look at it. If you perform, they will come, but they will all, will they be saved? Will they be saved? Performance churches have a big show, but are no show if the gospel is not preached. Now, here is the point. Solomon was a performer. He was performing this uh, attitude and this wisdom display to the world. But was he really leading the people to Christ? Now, notice here what's interesting. She never comes to Christ, really. She only comes to Solomon. That is interesting to me and also bears some critical uh, thinking later on. Now, let's go on to the next scripture. Now, the next scripture says, so Solomon answered all of her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. I mean, he explained everything to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built and the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters, and the apparel in his cupbearers, and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. Can you imagine being shown this, and then there's no more spirit in you? I mean, that would be quite some taking, wouldn't it? The important thing is this, as we remember, if you have it, they will come. But will they find God? Performance churches have lots of money and big spaces, but they have no place for the Word of God. Now, the Word of God is a very interesting thing, and it is that Word which brings you to Christ. But here she saw the great wisdom of Solomon and the great uh, display of his doorways and his pathways and, and what his servants were wearing. But what about what was in his heart? She got wisdom and she got understanding, but did she get Jesus? Now, that's a very important point. So with that point in mind, let's move on to the third segment that we get from this, which is this. Now, Proverbs chapter 9, 2 Chronicles 9, uh, verses 5 to 6. When, then she said to the king, it was, true, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Verse 6 says, however, did I not believe their words until I came and saw, I saw it with my own eyes. And then indeed, half the greatness of your wisdom was not told to me. You exceed the fame which I heard. I thought about this and I thought about, is it possible for you to go see someone who is said to be wise, is said to be empowered, and they really are, but they never point to the one who really empowers them. Now we know that this is true and uh, Joseph pointed to when Egypt, they came to him and they said, you're a great, you know, you're, you're a great God. And all. Joseph said, I am not. God is my greatness. And so here we see Solomon who is wise, very wise indeed. And he says, it is God or who is it that is your greatness? And he would just say all over again, it is wisdom, it is wisdom, it is wisdom with his wives and his concubines. And do you know, that he said this in the last part. If you sell it, they will buy it. But they will know Jesus Christ. Will they know Jesus Christ? Will they? Good question. The world is impressed with wealthy, marketable churches. But is God impressed? That's a really good question. Is God impressed with all of the work that we are doing with all of our scenes. You see, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things for God. And there's a fourth point, you should read it. It's in the Bible guide. But those things that they do with God, 
Do they bring the glory back to God or do they take it to themselves? We must always give glory to that which God has given us because it is He who has made us that great. And so with that in mind, we continue to study today the words of Solomon. today we think of prophets as some sort of mystical role, a mystical communicator between God and man. But in the ancient world, the prophet actually had an official function within the courts of the kings. The historical records of Israel's kings give an overview of how many prophets or seers were functioning during the days of the monarchy. Many readers are surprised at the source references in Chronicles that list books recording events and reigns of the kings written by prophets. In the days of King David, there are two prominent prophets. The first is Nathan, who confronted David on a few occasions and wrote a history entitled The Events of Nathan the Prophet. The second is Gad the Seer, who is also credited with writing a book about David's reign. The lifetimes of Rehoboam, David's grandson who split the nation, and Jeroboam who was chosen to rule the north were heavily influenced by prophets. Edo, the seer, wrote his visions and their history. There are two unnamed prophets in 1 Kings 13. Shemaiah the prophet warns Rehoboam about invasions, and Ahijah the Shilonite also prophesied and wrote. Throughout the remaining king's reigns appear prophets like Azariah, the son of Oded, Hanani, the seer, Hanani's son, Jehu, Micaiah, son of Imla, Eleazar, son of Dadavanhu, famous Elijah and Elisha, along with 100 unnamed prophets saved from Jezebel, and Oded, the prophet, who saved Judah from enslavement by Israel. There are prophets whose whole books are in the Bible. Jonah, Zephaniah, and Amos prophesied during the days of Jeroboam II of Israel and Uzziah of Judah, along with Isaiah and Hosea. After their time came Micah, then Nahum. The prophet Jeremiah ministered around the time of the destruction of Judah by Babylon, followed closely by Habakkuk. These books accurately represent history and give examples of what the lost book of the prophets probably looked like. How accurate is the Bible's history? Can we trust the Old Testament when it describes the kings of Israel? What are the archaeological discoveries that have opened up the world of the Bible, and how should we understand them? Join Rod Hembry and Corey Hembry Babechko as they discover the world of the Bible. In episode one, Rod and Corey will explore the reasons behind Israelite kingship. They will search out and explain archaeological finds that display the accuracy of the Old Testament. They will show you records from Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon that reflect biblical events. And they will show you the ancient signatures of some of Israel's most influential kings. Discovering the World of the Bible Episode 1 is offered to you for a donation of $25 or more. If you would like to receive your copy, write to us in Canada and around the world at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or call us at 519-940-8338. In the United States, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156. 156- 6680150 or call us at 724-733-8336 
Thank you for staying with us, Bible Discovery TV and Quick Study, and joining us on radio as well. Now, next time on the Quick Study television program, we're going to deal with the following topic. We're going to look at Proverbs chapter 30, 31, or 30 to 31. Now, we're going to specifically focus on Proverbs chapter 30, recognizing that we are not gods and that human nature is fallen. What does that mean? Well, we'll find out next time on Quick Study. Right now, it's time for Ryan Hembree with Cosmic Mysteries. As I said earlier in the program, I had to stop and talk with UFO researcher Gary Bates one more time before we continued in our study. Now, Gary's research, as well as others, has revealed some amazing facts, which gives us clues about the identification of these supposed alien beings. Here's Gary. <laughs> You know, what's uh, been interesting, since my book was published in 2005, uh, I've literally had hundreds of people contact me. I've met personally dozens and dozens of people who've seen things and have actually had these abduction experiences. And overwhelmingly, I want again, I want to say, don't just believe me, uh, read the book, you'll see the, the research of Harvard psychologists who've interviewed these people, and they will tell you that they're traumatized, they're damaged, even though the messages say that you know, these, uh, these alleged alien benefactors are here for our greater good. These perp people are treated nothing more than, than playthings. Uh, there are some horrible um, sexual things that are perpetrated upon uh, humans or what they believe is perpetrated upon them. And quite simply, the, the researchers, the psychologists have shown that uh, by and large these people suffer post-traumatic stress syndrome, syndromes, the same sort of stress that war veterans have when coming back from overseas. So you know that doesn't really fit in with the idea that they're highly evolved benevolent beings here to help us. In fact they're malevolent. That's what happens. People are damaged and traumatized and we can actually unpick this area uh, we're by understanding that they actually lie to us. They tell us about things that we demonstrably know are not true. You know, for example, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they used to tell us that they were from Venus or Mars. Now we've explored those places and certainly they're hostile to life. So now they say they're from the Pleiades or Zeta Reticuli or something like this where we cannot test their claims. And all that we keep doing is just pushing it further out to keep the ruse going. Uh, and these people, as I said, that are damaged, uh, sometimes they become evangelists also for their cause because they are hoodwinked into thinking that they're on some great cosmic mission. As I said, it becomes a religious experience for many of them. And one of the great difficulties we have in talking to these folks is the power of the experience. See, I can't go to them and say, well, you know, you really weren't abducted by an extraterrestrial because they'll just say, no, I was. I know what really happened to me. And I want to say to people out there, I'm not denying the experience. You know, you may have had an experience, but I believe you need to look under the surface of the experience because quite simply, if you are told something that is not true, well, the person that told you that is a liar. <laughs> I don't know how much more, more direct I can be, but if somebody lies to you, they are a liar. And so therefore, you know, maybe you should be thinking twice about trusting some of the other claims uh, before, you, before you really start to trust them. Gary made an extremely important point. Why should we believe anything these entities say if they are proven liars? Now next weekend, we will continue to look at some of the messages these beings are giving to mankind and attempt to lift the veil of secrecy on this whole UFO phenomenon. In the meantime, if you'd like to get a copy of Gary's book, it's called Alien Intrusion, and you can find it online at creation.com. Now, that book is actually my book. Your book is back in your office, <laughs> That's right? That's right, yeah. My book has a bunch of, like, markers in it and, and uh, not, not really good for TV. Well, my book has a signature in it from Gary, and uh, <laughs> it's very good. Anyway, so just making that clear. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, Ryan, who teaches on the Bible Discovery Seminary and, of course, the college. And I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to tell you about how you can get a hold of us. You can do so on Twitter at rod at the stream TV dot com or rod at the T rod TV uh, capital R O D underscore TV 
And then on the Facebook, you can get a hold of us at Facebook, Charles R. Hembry. Now, that's kind of interesting, but that's the one name you can look up and find us. Now, if you would like to write to us, then we would like to hear from you. You can write to us at P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668. 0150. Also get your book, that is your power guide or your Bible guide, at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Now you can call us and get a hold of that if you would like. Our phone numbers are 724-733-8336. In Canada, 519-940-8338. It may be that the new big is really small, or that the new popular is really regular. It may be that the new social media is old school friendship, face to face, I mean not Facebook style. Now this world as we know it seems to be getting tired of itself. That's a good thing. Solomon was a new king with all the ancient bling. He was so rich, smart and successful that the world around him was astounded. People came from near and far just to sit at his presence. But somehow they were all looking at Solomon and not the God of Solomon. There is great strength for living when we use the blessings of God to lift him up and not ourselves. With that, we pray, Lord, help me to give you all the glory for success you give me. Strengthen your mind. Our question for the Bible discovery is this. Where does God in the Bible say it is honorable for a man to stop a fight? Well, if you think you know the answer to that question, go to Bible Discovery TV and click on Strengthen Your Mind. It'll take you to a page where all the answers are and you can sort of consider it and figure it out. But I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ today. I want to talk to you about making him Lord of your life. And you say, well, why, why would I do that? You might be in a position where you're tired of being Lord and you're tired of all the burden that brings on you coming up with something to be Lord over. But did you know that Jesus Christ gave you a task, gave you a reason to live? And that reason is in his heart. And he says, I'll share my heart with you. I'll share your reason to live. If you believe that I died on the cross and that I rose again, I live forevermore and you make me Lord of your life. Come to Jesus today. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study Bible Discovery TV. Remember, we are supported by viewers just like you. Would you become a Discovery Partner and support us with an offering in any amount? You can do so by supporting online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.